So, today, obviously, you're all here um, to sample a little bit of Happy About Winkle. Now, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's come. I know there's a lot of trade training sessions and tracing sessions that go on in Manchester, so obviously, Papi is something that doesn't happen every day, so it's nice to see the amount of, sort of interest we had when we posted it on Facebook initially. And, and congratulations to everyone for you know, being drawn out of the hat and being lucky enough to, to be invited down. So, without further ado, this is Preston Van Winkle. I'm going to hand over. Preston's going to take us through a bit of the history of Pappy, um, for those that don't know it, and then we're going to get into the tasting sessions. But if anyone has any questions, uh, if you can hold on to them until, you know, we'll, we'll open up the room at some point during the tasting so you can answer anything. If there's anything that you want to know that we're talking about, shout it out, but try and hold your questions till the end if that's alright, because I'm sure there will be quite a lot. Okay? Cool. Over to you, Thank Preston. You. Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Preston Van Winkle, a uh, fourth generation member of my family. To get into the business, uh, it started with my great grandfather, uh, Julian Van Winkle Sr. His nickname was Pappy, that guy you see on the label there. Um, he started right out of university as a salesman uh, for the W.L. Weller and Sons Wholesale House in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, in 1893, uh, he started selling whiskey out of a horse and buggy uh, initially. Um, eventually, he started traveling by train and, and car uh, once those were a little more prevalent. Um, he was rumored to have sold uh, sold product either by the barrel or by the bottle to moonshiners because uh, they, they thought it would make their product uh, more appealing. Uh, so he, uh, he sold, the two big brands at that point were W.L. Weller and Old Fitzgerald. W.L. Weller obviously owned by the Weller Wholesale Company. Uh, at that time it was commonplace uh, for wholesale companies to have their own brands that they marketed and sold. Uh, they would have a, a distillery make those products for them. Uh, in this case, uh, the whiskey was made at the Stitzel Distillery, also in Louisville. They owned the Old Fitzgerald brand that Pappy sold. Um, in 1903, Pappy and another Weller salesman by the name of Alex Farnsley uh, bought controlling interest in the Weller company, and a couple years later bought controlling interest in the Stitzel Distillery. They operated those two businesses independently of one another uh, until 1919 when Prohibition began. Uh, at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, at that time the Weller Wholesale Company effectively dissolved. No need to have a wholesale company when you can't sell bourbon. Uh, going into Prohibition there were 211 registered distilleries in the state of Kentucky. Obviously there were a lot more illicit distilleries as well. Um, but at the end of Prohibition in 1933, there were only six distilleries left. Uh, Stitzel, or excuse me, the Stitzel Distillery was one of six distilleries given a special license by the federal government to produce medicinal whiskey. At that time, if you were a doctor uh, or a certain type of doctor, you could, you had the right to prescribe a certain amount of bourbon each month. So it was, uh, it was good if you uh, had a doctor who was free or if you were a doctor. Uh, you could go and uh, get a prescription for bourbon and pick it up at the pharmacy. Um, actually, the other night in London, saw a, a pristine bottle um, of medicinal whiskey. It had a prescription label on it, just like you would get uh, on a bottle of pills from, from the pharmacy. Uh, and also, they had uh, the prescription written by the doctor that accompanied that, that bottle. Uh, and on the tax stamp, it said distilled in 1916, bottled in 1923. So it was obviously a a prohibition era uh, bottle, um, since there were, wasn't a whole lot of a whole lot of whiskey sold uh, over the counter uh, during prohibition. When prohibition ended in 1933, uh, Pappy and his partners began construction of the modern day Stitzel Weller Distillery. They merged the two companies at that point, and they opened that distillery on Kentucky Derby Day, 1935, uh, through a big derby party, a lot of mint juleps, obviously, um, and. Just a, a, a real big to-do, big celebration, a uh, big, uh, big point in time for my family. Uh, Pappy operated that distillery uh, until his death in 1965. Uh, he smoked a cigar and drank a little bit of bourbon every single day of his adult life, and it finally caught up with him at the age of 91. Uh, uh, no Van Winkle has ever been a master distiller. We've always just had the good sense to pay the best in the business to do that job for us. Um, <clears throat> When Pappy died, my grandfather, who had joined his dad uh, after World War II, uh, took over and he operated the distillery until 1972 when a big conglomerate called Norton Simon 
approached him with a buy offer. He didn't want to sell, uh, but the bourbon business wasn't doing all that well at that point. Uh, so family members who were shareholders but weren't actively involved uh, forced my grandfather to sell. So he sold the distillery along with all of the, the big brands. At that point, the, the big four were W.O. Weller, Old Fitzgerald, Cabin Still, and Rebel Yell. <coughs> Rebel Yell was a, uh, kind of a kitschy brand that my grandfather created in the 50s or 60s. Uh, it was originally sold exclusively below the Mason-Dixon line, which was the north-south border uh, between or during the Civil War. My grandfather was a big Civil War buff. He was an army captain himself, so uh, he liked, liked reading up on uh, tactics from both sides. Uh, he was fascinated by, by the Civil War in general, um, <clears throat> so kind of just created this brain for fun. Uh, now you can hardly ever find it in Kentucky. You're more likely to see it over here or in Japan. Uh, than you are in Kentucky. But um, so he sold everything with the exception of one label. Uh, the label he kept was a pre prohibition brand that he'd acquired from a friend in the 50s or so uh, uh, called Old Rip Van Winkle. Uh, Rip Van Winkle is a storybook character. There's a, an American author named Washington Irving that wrote, uh, wrote this story back in the 1800s uh, about a fellow named Rip Van Winkle who lived in the Catskill Mountains of, of New York. And the story goes, the very short version of it is uh, he got in a fight with his wife, grabbed a jug of whiskey and his musket, and marched up into the woods to go hunting. And rather than hunt, he drank the whole jug of whiskey, passed out, had hallucinations of gnomes and fairies dancing about, and uh, passed out for 20 years and emerged from the woods with a long flowing white beard. Uh, so you can see on this bottle there's a little, <clears throat> little sketch of what Rip looked like. Um, the original pre-prohibition package was a pint, a pint, and uh, the front label had a picture of Rip that looked pretty similar to that. It was in color, uh, but the back of the bottle, uh, molded in the glass, was a relief of Rip with his long, flowing white beard, kind of extending around the sides of the bottle. It was a really neat package. Really terrible whiskey. Uh, it was a four-grain bourbon, uh, so corn, wheat, rye, and barley. Uh, we've got several bottles in our family collection. I've tried others at, at, at historical bottle tastings, and every time we taste one, we're hoping that it's going to be really good, and every time we're disappointed to see that it was just like the one prior was really bad. Um, so anyway, uh, Norton Simon uh, made an agreement with my grandfather to continue to produce uh, barrels for him for this Old Rip Van Winkle brand as well as bottle it for him. The original Old Rip Van Winkle, or I guess the, our original Old Rip Van Winkle, uh, was seven years old. There were two expressions. One was 90 proof, 45% ABV. Uh, in the States, we tend to talk in terms of proof instead of ABV. It goes back to uh, frontier days when uh, traveling salesmen, in an effort to show that their whiskey was quality, was high enough in alcohol uh, to be worth the money they were charging, would add it to gunpowder, light it, and if it burned blue, you would prove uh, that it was quality. Um, so that term just kind of stuck over the years. Uh, the other expression was 107 proof, 53.5% ABV. Um, so for a few years, they sold. Uh, he sold these seven-year-old, uh, seven-year-old bottlings. My dad joined up in '77, the year I was born. Um, and right, right about that same time, they shifted the age statement from seven to ten years old and continued selling those uh, for several more years, just, just those two brands. My grandfather died in 81, and at that time, Norton Simon came to my dad and said, look, we'll continue to produce barrels for you at Stitzel Weller, but we're not gonna do the bottling for you anymore. Uh, so my dad had to find somebody else to do the bottling for him. He found a little uh, distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, which is just outside of Frankfurt, the state capital. Um, and while they had torn down the actual still house, they still had a, a barrel warehouse, uh, a processing facility, a bottling hall, finished goods warehouse, offices, etc. cetera. Uh, so they did the bottling for them for a couple years, and, or excuse me, a couple months before they went belly up. And uh, at that point, my dad's real only option was to, uh, to buy that facility. So I think he paid, uh, in 1983, paid $80,000 for it. When we sold it in 2002, I think he sold it for $80,000. Um, the place was kind of falling apart by the time we vacated. 
Uh, so anyway, at that at that time, my dad had to become the warehouse manager, the truck driver, the whiskey processor, the bottling hall operator, uh, president, CEO, etc. He would have some old retired ladies from town come a couple times a week and slap labels on bottles for him. Um, that went on for 15 or 20 years. Uh, I joined him in 2001, right out of school. Uh, and as my dad likes to say, uh, doubled the size of the company overnight. Um, so at that point, I became the warehouse supervisor, the truck driver, the processor, bottling hall operator, etc. Gave my dad. Uh, the opportunity to get out on the road and sell. Um, I would do some road work as well. Back then, we were we were really trying. We were begging people to buy our products. It's a, it was a very different situation than than we're in now. Um, so while my dad was going to London and Paris and New York and San Francisco, I was going to Peoria, Illinois, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Garden City, Kansas. And uh, he got the glamour the glamour gigs. I I did everything else. Um, so uh, Diageo, over the course of many years and many sales and mergers and acquisitions, Diageo came to own Stitzelweller and for some reason uh, decided to shut the distillery down in 1992. Uh, I'm not sure why. I've never been able to get a, a good answer, neither has my dad, out of anybody from Diageo. I don't think there's anybody left there that <clears throat> was around when that, was, that decision was made. Um, it's baffling to us. They decided to shutter the uh, shutter the doors of the greatest bourbon distillery, in our opinion, the greatest bourbon distillery ever. Um, so, uh, as time went on, my dad realized that we were going to need a new whiskey supply. Uh, we needed somebody who was producing uh, the weeded recipe that we use. Uh, we needed somebody who was producing really high quality product, and. Right about that time, uh, Mark Brown, the president of Buffalo Trace, approached my dad and said, hey, do you, what do you think about a, a joint venture? They had acquired the Weller brand a few years earlier and were producing one of Pappy's old weeded recipes for that Weller brand. Uh, initially, my dad turned him down, uh, but over a, over a meal, uh, my mom, dad, and I kind of sat down and mulled it over <clears throat> and uh, realized that, that this short of taking on investors and building our own distillery, which is exceedingly expensive, uh, we didn't we didn't want to take on investors uh, and be beholden to somebody else in that manner. So uh, kind of rethought things, and my dad was going to go back to Mark and say, "Hey, maybe we'll maybe we'll chat about this." But Mark approached my dad at the Kentucky Bourbon Festival uh, in September of two thousand one and uh, said, hey, have you given any more thought to it? And Dad said, yeah, actually, maybe we ought to, ought to sit down and uh, sort this thing out and uh, see what we can come up with. So in 2000, June of 2002, we officially <coughs> partnered with Buffalo Trace. They do everything from grain to bottle at this point. Um, and they help us out with sales, uh, accounting, et cetera. It, it basically took all the physical labor portion of it out of it for my dad and myself. Um, I, I miss rolling barrels around. I miss driving the 1972 Dodge box truck with 13,000 miles of crude uh, a quarter mile at a time. Uh, getting the spray out to get it started. You had to spray this stuff in the, the carburetor. Have somebody else try and start it, turn it over. Um, thing was a pain in the ass, but it was, uh, you know, there was a rom romantic value to it, sentimental value to it. Um, but it's freed my dad and myself up to do more of this sort of thing, uh, get the word out. Uh, it gave us instant access to Buffalo Trace's national sales force, so we saw an immediate uptick in, uh, in sales, uh, put our products in markets that they had never been before, um, not because we didn't want them to be there, we just hadn't gotten around to try and force it down people's throats in those markets. Uh, we had already started to get a little bit of traction uh, prior to our partnership with Buffalo Trace, but that's when things started to uh, uh, really ratchet up. A few more things happened along the way um, in terms of making our products more visible. Um, bar and restaurant people uh, have, have been instrumental in our success, just hand selling, upselling, whatever you want to call it, uh, of our products. Uh, liquor store clerks have been instrumental, um, again, hand-selling uh, consumers. Uh, 
started popping up on TV shows and in movies. Some celebrity chefs like Anthony Bourdain and Sean Brock uh, started mentioning our products, uh, either in print or on television, on their television shows. Um, uh, whole snowball effect, um, perfect storm of events and whatnot uh, have really led to uh, where we are now, uh, which is everything's on allocation, it's hard to find, secondary market prices are nutso. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's how I ended up here. Um, any questions about any of that? Before we move on to the meat of the discussion. Um, we're going to taste left to right in front of you, starting with the 10-year-old. Um, so the 10, 12, and 15-year-old are all 100% Buffalo Trace distillation. Uh, the 20-year, I'm fairly certain, comes from kind of an interim distillery that we used uh, between the time Stitzelweller shut down and the time that Buffalo Trace started uh, producing our recipe. Uh, it's called Bernheim. Uh, it's now owned by uh, Heaven Hill. So you, uh, I, I'm pretty sure we'll know when we taste it, but um, I'm pretty sure it's Bernheim whiskey. Uh, it's it's a little different. Anytime you switch equipment, switch yeast strains, switch warehouse locations, you're going to notice a difference in flavor, even if you're using the exact same mash bill. Uh, and then the 23-year-old is still 100% Stitzelweller juice. Uh, net, this coming fall will be the last of the 23-year-old 100% Stitzelweller. Uh, so. Unfortunately, once that's gone, it's gone. Um, I don't see Diageo cranking the stills up at Stitzelweller anytime soon. Um, the still house, and it's really sad to see the still house and fermenter room are essentially a giant pigeon coop. Everything's covered in pigeon shit. It's uh, pretty nasty, unfortunately. There's a bunch of asbestos which would have to be removed. To the tune of several million dollars. But anyway, um, a lot of times people ask me when we're doing tastings like this, what should I be tasting or smelling? And my answer is, I don't know, you tell me. It's your, your nose and your tongue. Um, I'm terrible with descriptors. I know what I like and don't like. I will say that you're going to get a lot of caramel and vanilla um, across the board. Uh, and I, obviously, as we get older, uh, more oak. But uh, the caramel and vanilla notes come from both the corn uh, and the barrel, because we use corn, wheat, and barley as opposed to the more common corn, rye, and barley. You don't get the typical spiciness that you would from a, a bourbon made with rye. You get more of the light toasty notes from the, from the barrel, um, more caramel and vanilla, less pepper and spice. Uh, it's a softer mouthfeel, ages more gracefully. Um, at 10 years old, we're already older than a lot of distilleries, older products, uh, and then on up into the 20 and 23, you rarely see bourbons made with uh, corn, rye, and barley that age because they do get really heavy, bitter, or spicy. There are a few out there. Um, a lot of them are the result of barrels being found uh, or paperwork gets lost on them and the warehouseman stumbles on them, goes looking to see what it is and discovers that there are no records, so they'll They'll pull it out, bottle it, create a label around it, and, and a lot of times sell it in Japan because uh, you can sell anything with the word bourbon on it in Japan at just about any price. <laughs> or at least in the 80s and 90s, you definitely could when their economy was really, really cracking. Uh, it's slowed down a little bit over there now, but um, they're still whiskey nuts. Um, anyway, let's get started with the 10-year-old. Again, it's 53.5% ABV, so I would suggest trying it neat, and then maybe if you're so inclined, add a drop or two of water to it uh, to open it up. Uh, unlike wine that is only 13 to 17 percent alcohol typically uh, that you need to swirl um, to kick off some of those alcohol vapors to experience that component of it, you shouldn't do it with something like this that's this high proof. Um, I tend to either stick my nose in and breathe out first to kind of clear out some of those alcohol vapors or kind of blow off the top. Uh, if you do swirl it, you're going to kick off those alcohol vapors, and that's going to mask all the subtlety and nuance of everything else that's going on in there. Um, you can try swirling it and nosing it also and see how different it is. I, Because I literally cut my teeth on bourbon, I'm very accustomed to the uh, relative potency of it. And... Uh, I prefer the higher proof stuff, typically. I didn't know there was anything called cough medicine until I was probably 12. Uh, my parents used to just take a little 
glass jigger and put a little bit of bourbon, honey, water, and maybe some lemon juice. Um, throw it in the microwave for five or six seconds, and that'll knock a three-year out cold. Three-year-old out cold. <laughs> I haven't tried that with my kids, but I, I definitely dip my finger in, in some whiskey and rubbed it on their gums when they were teething. My daughter who turned four today took a sip of my drink when she was about two and a half and went, mmm. <laughs> I had my hands full with her. <laughs> so to me, I would expect something at 53.5% ABV to have a, a pretty good bite on it. Uh, there's definitely in my opinion, there's definitely some alcohol heat up front, but it burns off really quickly and leaves you with a nice, soft, sweet finish. Um, the 10 and 15 year old, to me, because of the higher proof, um, are great for old fashions, uh, especially if you don't have really good ice, which everybody in this country seems to have good ice. Uh, my first visit to London in 2001 uh, turned me into a cocktail and ice snob. And I'm pleased as punch about it, but it, it does get frustrating when you go to go order a, an old fashioned and you get sloppy, wet, wet ice. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody here seems to have good, cold, hard, big ice cubes or chips off chunks of from a big block of ice. We have a good ice company in Louisville, but I don't really have anywhere to put a 30 pound block of ice. I guess I could stick it in the bathtub, but that might be a little gross. <laughs> Thoughts, questions, comments? Like it, don't like it? I won't be offended if you don't. There are plenty of other people who do. <laughs> I used to get a little bit offended, but you know, I don't like a lot of stuff probably up on that back bar there, so I'm definitely not offended when somebody's not a huge fan. Okay, guys, what are we getting on the pilot? Yeah, what do you all, I love hearing what other people pick up on, because again, I'm terrible with the descriptors. I got a bit sparkle. Yeah. The only one that I can describe anything that I'm really, like really concretely describe what I'm smelling and tasting on is the 15 year old, and that's uh, raisin and citrus, like orange peel. That's another reason that I think the 15-year-old makes a great old-fashioned. All of these react re really well to, to citrus. This brings up a funny story I'll tell in a minute. Actually, might as well just tell it now. Um, <laughs> I walked into a bar one night, or a restaurant bar, and I ordered a 10-year-old Old Rip Van Winkle on the rocks with a little splash of water and a twist of lemon. Happy drank it that way, my grandfather drank it that way, my dad drank it that way, I drank it that way. Not all the time, but you know, pre-dinner drink if I don't want a cocktail, don't want, you know, want something on the rocks, something cold. Um, so I'm assuming that my grandfather snuck sips of his dad's drink, and my dad, I know, snuck sips of his dad's drink, and I definitely snuck sips of my dad's drink, and probably just became accustomed, accustomed to <clears throat> to drinking it like that. Um, so I went up to the bar, ordered that, and the bartender said, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you like that. Pappy would roll over in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, said, I'll give you the, the whiskey, I'll give you the ice, I'll give you the, the lemon peel, and you can, you can do it, but I, I don't feel comfortable doing it. I don't think Pappy would approve. So, all right, your call. So <clears throat> after I finished my drink, I handed him my credit card and his face drained of all the <laughs> <laughs> He came over after he rung me up and uh, the manager came over and they both apologized profusely and I proceeded to tell him that I drink it that way, my dad drinks it that way, my grandfather and great-grandfather both drink it that way. and. Uh, he said, uh, lesson learned, I will never, never do that again. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think I maybe actually suggested he try it like that and he enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, all these 
react r really well to citrus um, for some reason. I don't know if it's the weeded recipe or what, but um, yeah, it, it, it makes them ideal, especially the 10 and 15 year old for old fashions, which are hands down my favorite cocktail. Um, I really wasn't a fan of the idea of mixing any of our, our products with anything other than air, ice, or water until that first first trip to London when I stumbled into uh, a place in West London that's no longer there as a, a members club called the Cobden Club. And uh, the bartender, bar manager there, a guy named Johan Svensson, um, was, uh, was in there and he made me an old fashioned <clears throat> after I said I wasn't a huge fan of whole cocktail with our products idea and uh, blew my mind, just set me on my ear. And he proceeded to make me what at the time seemed like really wild off the wall cocktails, but it, you know, they're uh, par for the course these days, especially uh, especially over here. Uh, the cocktail culture in the US is, is really um, light years behind what it is over here, unfortunately, unless you go to some pretty <coughs> pretty specific places in Chicago, New York, San Francisco maybe. Um, we've got some, some decent places popping up in Louisville finally, but um, yeah, the, the cocktail culture over here is just light years ahead, and so I love coming over. Coming over across the pond, um, this is actually my first visit up north. I'd never been outside of London before yesterday, uh, even after what, 16 years of coming over here. Um, Anyway, so um, that's my cocktail history, my ignorance. And then you see the light. Pretty big moment for me. Um, let's move on to the 12 year old. Uh, in the early mid 80s, my dad had, uh, he had barrels that were aging beyond 10 years old because they just weren't selling quickly enough uh, to get used up. So rather than sell 12-year-old bourbon at 10-year-old prices, uh, he decided to create a brand extension, and he came up with the Van Winkle Special Reserve. People ask why the label's so different, why it's so plain. Um, <clears throat> he just wanted something clean and crisp and reflective of the, the whiskey in the bottle. Um, he also wanted an opportunity, because the, the original 10-year-old package was a squatty bottle with a long, skinny neck um, because of the 70 CL laws over here. We had to send the 10 year old over in this bottle with the original 10 year old label which was this shape wrapped around it. It looked really funny to us but nobody ever seemed to question it since people hadn't really seen what it was supposed to look like. But uh, put it in this cognac style bottle um, and the idea was to let the, let the product speak for itself. No fancy packaging, um, no bells and whistles, just really good bourbon. and. Uh, it took off in the Chicago area, uh, but really didn't do anything in New York, for example, um, or out on the west. Out on the west coast, it did really well, or at least up in the San Francisco Bay area, because people drink so much co cognac and armagnac. They were familiar with something that looked like that. Uh, the simplicity of, of cognac and armagnac packaging. Um, some people love it. Some people hate it. I've grown up with it, so I don't. I like it, I guess. I don't really know that I've ever formed an opinion one way or the other, uh, but I know I like the whiskey. <laughs> um, this this one to me is the most <coughs> indicative of the weeded style of bourbon. It's very light, clean, crisp. Um, it's sweet, but not sugary sweet. Uh, it's My dad refers to it as nectar. Um, I would put it up against just about any other whiskey of any category on the planet in terms of overall drinkability or approachability. Um, yeah, I, would, I would say that if you like whiskey at all of any kind, you would probably appreciate this one. Um, it's great in a Manhattan because it is uh, because it is so gentle. It just kind of marries well with that style of cocktail. What's the ABV um, difference? Oh, I'm sorry, this one's 90.4 uh, proof or 45.2%. Uh, I always wonder what <clears throat> year these were bottled. Are you all familiar with the bottling codes on? <coughs> this is from last year, okay. Um, there's a little code printed directly, printed or patched directly on the glass about an inch from the bottom. 
maybe a little less than an inch. That tells you down to the minute. Uh, what time, what day and time it was bottled and on what bottling line at Buffalo Trace. So these were both done in 2016 on line four, for example. What do y'all think about this one? Smoother. Yeah. It's, uh, that, that lo the lower alcohol content um, allows for the, the sweetness of the of the corn in the barrel to show through. Are you all familiar with the caramel air in the barrel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I saw a head shake. No, uh, so during the charring process, every every tree has some level of wood or uh, level of sugar in it. Uh, the best example being um, the sugar maple. You stick a knife in it, and it'll just start oozing sugar essentially. Um, White American oak has a small amount of sugar in it, and during the charring process, that sugar is drawn to the heat. And at the end of the charring process, a little bit of that sugar that isn't burned, but that almost made it to the surface, is left in a caramelized state, just like throwing sugar in a pan and making caramel candy. Uh, so uh, as the as the liquid moves in and out of the wood during the, the aging process, it picks up uh, all of that color and flavor from the caramel layer and also the char layer. Uh, so going, obviously going into the barrel, it's crystal clear. So all of this color and most of the flavor comes from the barrel itself. Uh, the recipe that you use will determine what arc it takes in terms of flavor profile while in the barrel. Will that uh, alter the feel of the mouth as well? Yeah. Like a sugar content or a glycerin content within the liquor itself? Yeah, it kind of gives you, uh, uh, it can be almost like an oil slick on your tongue, kind of, it kind of coats, coats the mouth. Uh, That's coming from the barrel. <coughs> yes. Uh, so if you were to drink White Dog or uh, New Make, uh, Legal Moonshine, uh, you're not going to get nearly as much of, you get a little bit of sweetness from the corn, but it's a different kind of sweetness. Uh, it's, it's a noticeably different type of sweet. Um, I, I've asked this of groups the last several days. Has anybody ever tried corn pudding? Very common dish in the American South. It's essentially creamed corn that's then baked, uh, so it gets a little bit drier than the creamed corn would be, and it gets a nice crust over the top, but during the baking process, all, uh, a lot of that starch in the corn gets converted into sugar. Uh, and it's exceptionally sweet. It's, it's really delicious. Um, I, feel, I feel like we're cheating y'all out of, out of a, a secret dish down, down in the south by not preaching the gospel, at a, gospel of it all over the world like we do cheese grits. Uh, anybody ever had cheese grits? <laughs> so grits are kind of a roughly milled corn mash and just cook them in water or milk until they're uh, soft and then the, the cheaper the cheddar cheese you can add to them maybe a little bit more milk the better salt, a little salt and pepper God, heavenly my mom makes the best cheese grits I've ever had um, if we're talking delicacy, why well, you yet yet? I'm a free minutes on time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard, I heard delicacies. That's cool. That's cool. you are, if it's since we're talking delicacy, get yourself on free minutes on pies. It's a pie and a tin. Oh yeah. If you want British full chef, that's that's it. Where do I pick one of those up? <laughs> Any get get them anywhere. Okay. I'll we'll have to check it out. Oh, <laughs> No. <laughs> I'm, I'm up for trying new things. All right, the 15 year old, which is my personal favorite, back up to that 107 proof for 53.5% ABV. Um, like I said, I get raisins and orange peel. Uh, somebody said bananas the other day. I, I can, I can kind of see that. Um, again, try it neat, maybe add a drop or two of water uh, if you like. I like it at full strength. 
This is my dad's favorite too. We have very similar palettes, which makes barrel selection a lot, <laughs> a lot less, uh, uh, a lot less difficult. Very little conflict. We tend to agree on what, what's good and what's not. Yeah, I could drink that just about all day. Have you ever just sat and done it all day? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. like a Pedro Jimenez sherry. Like, as those notes. What in sherry? I said Pedro Jimenez. No, I've never had it. Rich. That's right. Okay. It's like really rich. Yeah, really good. I have to give it a whirl. Yeah, I, I can't say that I haven't gone through a whole bottle in a day, probably around Christmas time. Or, um, are you all familiar with our Thanksgiving? Yeah. That's another big drinking day. And cool weather holidays tend to equal a lot of consumption. That and football, American rules football, tailgating. It's not football. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I got the name football. There's very little. I think it's supposed to be the ball is one foot long. That's why it's actually called football. Really? <laughs> Learn something new every day. <laughs> the, the old, the old foot, like I have foot, my dad or grandfather played uh, high school and college football. Uh, and the old, I have some of his old footballs. They are considerably bigger than what you would see, see now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. I'll I'll go home and measure one. Uh, yeah, they're they're a lot. They were a lot bigger than they are now. Um, you see quarterbacks and they have just massive hands. Got to to get your mitts around one of those things. But yeah, there's there's very little action with the foot involved other than kick off and extra points and punting. <coughs> What was the FB in this one? 53.5%. Mm. Doesn't taste like it. The Teddy Roll was a lot more obviously higher. This one's a lot more smooth. This one to me is the perfect combination of age and proof. It's just something about it just uh, syncs up with my palate perfectly. When you pull it from the barrels, do you add anything to it, like a water to yeah. you know, even out the ABV? Yep. Yeah. So um, barrel entry proof and bottling proof uh, vary from brand to brand. Uh, currently, uh, and distillation proofs as well. Uh, by law, so I'm sure you all all know most of this, but by law, bourbon has to be made in the United States, has to be made from at least 51% corn, Can, can't have any artificial colorings or flavorings, has to be aged in a charred virgin oak barrel, doesn't have to be white American oak, it's just, that's very prevalent in the States, and it's a lot cheaper than, than French oak uh, by about six or seven times. Um, it produces a better, a better bourbon anyway. Um, and let's see, it, it has to be distilled at or below 160 proof or 80%. Entered into the barrel uh, no higher than 125 proof and bottled at or above 80 proof. Um, so our, our distillation proof is about 120, uh, 125. Our entry proof is about, or not is not about, is 114 proof. Uh, over time in the barrel, the volume decreases, but the proof goes up because it's water that's escaping the barrel more readily than alcohol. Uh, so typically when we dump a barrel, it's anywhere from 125 to 145 proof, uh, hopefully on the lower end. Because the more water you add after you dump it out of the barrel, the more uh, flat and bitter the bourbon can become. Um, I don't know what the science behind that is, but it just, just is. Uh, so putting it into the barrel at a lower proof, while it's more expensive because you need more barrels, uh, less alcohol per barrel, um, 
it produces a, a smoother product in the end. Um, Pappy had a saying, we make fine bourbon at a profit if we can, at a loss if we must, but always fine bourbon. It prob we did everything, my family's always done everything in a more expensive manner and as, a, and as is absolutely necessary, but and it probably is partly uh, responsible for having to sell in 72, but um, it just produces a much better product to do it uh, the way we do it. We'd actually like to lower entry proof to 105 or 107. Um, got historical documents that that show uh, entry proofs of 100, 105, 107, never anything above that at Stitzel Weller. Um, so we, we've actually started some experiments uh, with the micro or experimental still at Buffalo Trace uh, to see if we can recreate something closer to, to Stitzel Weller and prove to, to Harlan Wheatley, Buffalo Trace's master dis distiller, that that extra seven, seven to eight, nine proof degrees really does make that, that big of a difference. Um, we've just started those experiments, so I'll have to get back to you on it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, water escapes the barrel more easily than alcohol because it's a lot smaller molecule. And because that barrel is trying to achieve homeostasis, it's trying to be as damp on the outside as it is on the inside, it never obviously achieves that state. But the water is being drawn out of the, the, solute, the water and alcohol solution. Um, the, therefore, on higher floors where it's hotter, water, the barrel outside the barrel dries out much more quickly. Uh, the liquid is warmer, so it's throwing off vapors uh, more readily. Um, so it ages a lot more rapidly, and the evaporation rate is a lot higher, and the, the jump up in proof over time is a lot greater. Uh, also along the periphery of the warehouse, uh, there's a lot more airflow. The windows of the warehouses are opened in the morning and closed at night. So during the day, you've got a lot of good air circulation around the outside of the warehouse. So the outside of that barrel is drying out more quickly. Again, faster evaporation rates of water, uh, faster evaporation rates, period. Uh, and a greater jump up in the <coughs> For that reason, we like to keep our barrels on the first two floors um, and in the heart of the warehouse where the, the conditions are a lot, uh, a lot more mild. Uh, on a hot summer day in Kentucky, when it's in the, the high 90s Fahrenheit, it wouldn't be uncommon to have the top floor of a, a barrel warehouse be 120, 125 degrees. Uh, and at the same time, at that same very moment, the bottom floor in the middle of, of the warehouse might be 70, 75 degrees. So it's a, it's a huge, huge difference from the, the bottom floor to the top. And you go to the periphery and it's you know, you've got hot, humid air moving around, uh, drying things out as well. So we like to keep things in a, in a much gentler, more consistent, uh, consistent climate. Is there a specific water source that you use? Or? So most distilleries ended up where they did for a couple of reasons. One was uh, access for grain and raw materials coming in, and also a way to get finished product back out. So before the rail system uh, was an option, the only other option was roads or water. The, war, the road system wasn't any better than the rail system uh, in the 17, 1800s. Uh, so water was the best, the best way to move things about. Kentucky has more navigable waterways than any other state in the country. I find that hard to believe, but it, apparently it's true. <laughs> um, we've dammed a lot of them up to create lakes, but um, anyway, so a lot of distilleries would end up uh, where they did because of uh, the transportation options, but also because of the potential for a good well. Uh, the central third of the state of Kentucky sits on top of a huge limestone shelf. Uh, and what these limestone aquifers and shelves do uh, as the water passes over and through them, uh, it makes them mineral rich but iron free. So it's really soft. Um, 
really soft on the palate, and the removal of the iron is the most important part. Uh, if you have any iron in your water, uh, it'll oxidize, and it'll turn the whiskey a blackish green color. Uh, it's not very, it typically doesn't affect the flavor, but God, it's hard to look at. Um, I've seen barrels dumped that look like tar, they're so black. Uh, but it really doesn't affect the flavor, but it's monkeys with your head, for sure. Some have come out green, like like you would only want to see one day a year, uh, green whiskey. Uh, there's, there's a running joke in Chicago, they can turn the river, the Chicago River green one day a year, why, why can't they turn it blue the other 364 days? They <laughs> died the Chicago River green on, on St. Patty's Day, kind of funny. Uh, yeah, so uh, the well, the wells that people used originally were were vital uh, to the production process. Now, due to not actual groundwater contamination, but the potential for it, uh, most distilleries use city water run through a reverse osmosis filter. So it come, what you end up with is just H two O, no minerals, no sodium, nothing, um, and it's very dry. Uh, it sounds paradoxical uh, to have dry water, but uh, if you drink enough of it, uh, it really does kind of dry you out. Because none, those minerals aren't being absorbed by your body and holding the water in. <laughs> uh, it dries your, your mouth out too, but it's um, what most everybody uses these days. At our old place in Lawrenceburg, uh, we, had a, we had well water and we ran it through what's called a demineralizer but it, it does actually leave a lot of minerals, but it, it extracts iron um, and sulfur. The, the, the well, uh, that pump house had a funky, funky nature to it, but the water <clears throat> that came off the demineral demineralizer, we could have sold, if we had had the forethought to do it, we could have sold, bottled it and sold it, it, it was great water. Um, other factors that influenced where distilleries ended up uh, were the access to corn um, and also uh, proximity to where the Ohio River, uh, there are a couple of different areas where there are small waterfalls. And so people would naturally have to stop their flat boats as they were coming down from Maryland, Pennsylvania, et cetera. Uh, they would have to stop their flat boats, get off, and get back on after portaging, some people just hung around. So there are little clusters of distilleries near Maysville, Kentucky, where the first set of waterfalls is, and then there are clusters of distilleries um, in and around Louisville, where the second set of waterfalls uh, are. There are dams and lock and dam systems now that make them a little, a little easier to pass. All right, the 23-year-old, or 20-year-old, excuse me. Um, this is one that kind of put uh, put our family back on the bourbon radar. Uh, in like 1995, um, we had the 10-year-old, 12-year-old, and uh, in the mid-80s, my dad also created the 15-year-old Old, old Rip Van Winkle package. Look just like the 10-year-old package, still that squat bottle with the long neck. Um, the only difference was it had a 15 on a little neck crescent uh, instead of a 10. So over time, people got the two confused a lot. Liquor store shelves, you, you pay for 10-year-old and get 15 or vice versa. Um, so for simplicity's sake, uh, we moved it into the happy package in 2008, I think. Um, and it's worked out just fine for us. But uh, in like 1995, my dad was rummaging through the basement and came across this great old black and white picture of Pappy lighting a cigar. I uh, thought it, this might make a cool label. Um, he was also, in, he had some older barrels and he was interested in doing something to pay homage to his grandfather. Uh, so he came up with the 20 year old Pappy. And uh, our Chicago wholesaler unbeknownst to us, sent, submitted it to the Beverage Testing Institute in Chicago. Uh, it's an organization that uh, you send them two bottles and $200 and they 
taster product line. They have an in-house panel and they also pull in bartenders and sommeliers and writers and chefs and people who know spirits. Uh, they come in and they, they know what category they're tasting, but they don't know what the product is and they, they generate a, uh, a one out of a hundred rating and they gave the 20 year old a 99 rating. It was the only American whiskey that had ever been given a 99 rating. Uh, and the only other whiskey of any kind that had been given, given a 99 rating was a ultra aged, uh, single malt that was, you know, available for two to four thousand dollars or something for a 375 ml. So essentially an unattainable whiskey. Um, when this came out in 95 or six, uh, the shelf price, at least in the U.S., was forty-four ninety-five. Um, so very, very attainable, very reasonable price. Um, so that got the phone ringing again. Uh, things started started to to click along uh, with that. Um, the BTI, if you see a rating that isn't attributed to somebody else uh, in a trade publication or an advertisement. Chances are, if it's a spirit, chances are it came from the BTI. They do spirits from across the globe. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat organization. Um, you can go on their website and look at all their past ratings. Um, we later submitted the 10 and tw or the 12 and 15 year old. Those both got 98s. Uh, the 10 year old got a 95. We'd never submitted the, the 23. We, we resubmitted. Um, reluctantly resubmitted the 20 year old five or six years ago and it, uh, we were afraid that it was going to get a, uh, a very disappointing rating but it got a 99 again <laughs> so um, clearly the people of Chicago like <laughs> like our bourbons but um, this one doesn't really need any water added to it um, dad calls this one butter whiskey uh, I think the 20 and 23 year old make great after dinner drinks, um, they really benefit from a nice, a nice good meal ahead of time. Um, great cognac or armagnac substitute, port, I guess. So it's still surprisingly <laughs> bright, not, not very oaky. After 20 years, you would expect a, an American whiskey to have a lot more oak uh, on it uh, than, than what this does. And to me, it's still really, really sweet in a, in a nice way. What do you all think about it? Quite nutty. Nutty, yeah, I've heard that a couple times this week. Between them all, when you sell, like obviously not what I'm trying to buy on the internet. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> like, well, hopefully now with our new relationship with High Spirits, um, you'll hopefully you'll see prices come back to earth uh, with the strategies that they're employing uh, in selling our products. But um, suggested retail price in the U.S. is uh, 60, 80, 100, 160, and 270. Or 170 and 270. Um, over here, what I would hope you would see, at least on a store shelf, would be roughly that same number, but with the pound symbol instead of instead of the dollar symbol. Um, the difference in price being the, uh, the taxes that are that are levied coming across the Atlantic. So say I, I'm lucky enough to get all these for my bar. Like, yeah, cool, pack my one call. And then people come in and they want to buy it. And like you in that bar that one day, and they're sort of going, no, Pappy would want that. Is there, if somebody orders, like, can I have a 23 year old Pappy with uh, Diet Coke? Which one's just to go, no, fuck off. <laughs> um, I would gently ask, why would you want to spend that much money on the whiskey and Coke? Uh, I mean, you dump a bunch of Coca-Cola on top of that this stuff, and you, if you can tell the difference between that and, like, Beam and Coke, you got a much better better palate than I do, and if, if that floats your boat, fine. You know, I, I'm of the opinion that 
you know, it's your money, drink, drink whatever you want, however you, however you want to drink it, but you as the bartender, I would <laughs> encourage I encourage you to say, are you really sure you want to do that? <laughs> Gently, though. <laughs> it's not like the bartender who said to you, I'm going to save you that drink. Yeah, uh, if he had just said, or if he had asked why I wanted it like that, or um, asked if I was familiar with the product, um, he could have gone, <laughs> gone about it. You know, you know, if he had said, "Are you?" Um, I'm curious. Why do you like it like that? Are you are, are you familiar with the Van Winkle bourbons, or something along those lines? Instead of just flatly, rudely saying, "No, I'm not going to serve it like that," and then throwing in, "Pappy would roll over in his grave" or something to that effect, or "Pappy wouldn't approve." Um, that that's what stuck in my crawl was was that component of it. Um, yeah, I, um, a woman in one of my sessions yesterday who was a bartender said, well, I kind of side with him. Maybe he was just trying to educate. And my argument was, well, there was a much better way to do that. Um, a much more polite and educationally founded way of coming at that, at that situation. So, you know, if he said, Hey, are you familiar with these brands, or, or why do you why do you want to drink it like that as opposed to neat or just on the rocks or whatever? I could have then said, "Well, here's who I am. Here's why I like it like this, uh, etc." So, um, yeah, I, I love going into a bar and learning about about new products. Y'all know a shitload more about the stuff that's up there than I do. I know this stuff pretty darn well, but I don't know a whole lot about a whole lot of other stuff. So. I love learning about new spirits and, and whatnot. Um, it's one of the things I love about coming over here is I get to try a lot of stuff that I wouldn't necessarily see at home anywhere in the States. Uh, so I love the educational component, but if that guy just came across. Again, and you had to pick one of the bourbons to drink, which one would it be? Uh, I guess Weller is the closest thing to it. Um, yeah, I don't know if it'd be the, the antique or the twelve-year-old. If I could just have unfettered access to it, maybe probably the twelve-year-old, ten-year-old, or the antique's a little, excuse me, a little, a little bit easier to come by. I haven't seen a bottle of twelve-year-old Weller on a shelf in Kentucky in probably two years, though, so it's getting harder and harder to come by. But I, I like. A lot of different spirits categories. I like beer. I like wine. Uh, so if I could never drink this again, I'd I'd hate it, but I'd I'd find something. <laughs> I'm sure. Gotten into rum a little bit lately. Just got back from Nicaragua. A lot of good rum down there, but it's a cartel of a family that owns Florida Cana. Apparently, there are a couple couple bars that. I've Heard about in London that refused to stock it because of the, their business practices. The family that owns Florida Cana, if you try and introduce another rum, they will shoot you. <laughs> uh, quite literally, they will shoot you dead in the street. Um, but it's good rum. Uh, I got good cigars down there too. Nice beaches. I would strongly suggest check checking out Nicaragua if you're so inclined as to go to Central America. Dirt cheap for now. Costa Rica's gotten too expensive for some people, so they've, they've started going north up into Nicaragua. A lot of nice resorts on the beach on both sides. And in the northeast, they got a lot of really good cigar factories. Cigar tourism is really big down there. We saw like our whole plane from Miami to Managua was nothing but people going for either returning home or going for cigar tours. You like cigars. Good spot. Do y'all like the 20 year old? Yeah, me too. All right, last but certainly not least, the 23 year old. I'd, at any given moment, I would probably say I prefer the 20 to the 23, but to me, the 23 has 
um, certain conditions environmentally have to be met. I, I like it after a good meal, possibly with a, a cigar. Um, colder weather, it's nice and chilly out today. Um, but it, it's a, it's a pretty unique product, so I'd, I'd reserve it for, I guess, more unique situations. Um, it's again surprisingly soft and sweet for being in the barrel 23 years. This one's a 95.6 proof, so that what? 47.8 percent ABV. So kind of in between the uh, the other two, um, the 90.4 and the 107. Uh, Still get a lot of caramel and vanilla. Definitely get more oak on this one than than its younger siblings. But the oak is again, it's that light toastiness from the barrel. It's not the heavy bitter qualities that you that you could potentially get. I don't know if it if it's the wheat that acts as a buffer to the oak, or if it's the absence of rye picking up the the heaviness from the oak. Um, only the, the bourbon and the barrel know the answer to that for sure, but uh, I so rarely get to drink this. I've had more of this in the last three and a half days than I've had in years. <laughs> kind of <laughs> fringe benefit of coming over over here. Do you choose not to drink it? Just don't have an opportunity to. <laughs> A lot of people assume I have unfettered access to this stuff. I don't. I can't just walk into the distillery and start grabbing bottles willy-nilly. Um, uh, the federal excise tax. <laughs> the, the federal excise tax on distilled spirits in the U.S. is one of the biggest money makers for the government. So every opportunity that they have to collect said tax dollars, they take, and they're very strict about it. Uh, the government records that have to be kept on. On production of distilled spirits in the U.S. are, are uh, demanding and exhaustive and uh, the government used to have, so every distillery used to have an office where, as they call them, the government man would sit and collect the paperwork and monitor the distillery. Um, that's no longer the case. They rely on uh, you know, government cutbacks and whatnot. They'd, they'd actually have to pay somebody to do a job. Um, so they rely on us to self-report, uh, but they do drop in unannounced every now and then and check up on uh, the level of reporting. But um, yeah, I. so what I have of these products at my house right now are one bottle of 10, may have a bottle of 15, but I don't think so. I have two 20s and two 23s. One of the 20s and one of the 23s are spoken for by somebody I, I traded. Uh, traded some work for um, so really I don't have much I feel guilty having any for myself because a bottle that I have is a bottle that you as a consumer wouldn't have in your liquor cabinet so um, my dad and I have a, a guilt complex when it comes to that stuff we I drink more Buffalo Trace than anything um, Weller when I can find it uh, and that's getting harder and harder uh, my freaking brother-in-law is a salesman, so he's all over town, all over Kentucky and all over Tennessee all the time, and he just pops in stores and buys it all up. He's got 50 or 60, 100 bottles, I don't know. Um, he's hoarding it, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I have very little. What, it, what does end up at my house are bottles, like, Say I were doing a tasting at a bar or restaurant, uh, I would take home the the partials if I supplied them. If they if the bar or restaurant supplied them themselves, I might, <laughs> I might try and sneak out with one. Do you have any sort of vintage bottles that you need to have yeah. behind? He's got a lot more than I do. Um, I've got a few bottles, good old bottles of Weller and Old Fitz. Um, got a, a bottle of. Uh, uh, we've got one of those old Rip Van Winkle bottles, but I won't be opening that anytime soon. Have you ever smashed the barrel of like 30 
No, there's so little left in a bottle of 23 that uh, letting it age any longer is a huge risk. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, I've got, a, the, I think the coolest bottle I've got um, is a bottle of a brand called Old Mock that was produced uh, by the Stitzel Distillery before Prohibition. <coughs> I think it was, I think it was barrel, barreled right before Prohibition began and bottled right after. And it, it's, it came in a little, it's a pint bottle, came in a cardboard box. Um, the box is in great shape, the, the bottle's in great shape. But the, the way the, it's not Old English, but it, the script is different. Uh, so it looks like it reads Old Mork, but the R is actually, what looks like an R is actually a C. And so we had a hard time tracking this brand down because we thought it was Old Mork for years. And then we got a hold of a, a bourbon historian by the name of Mike Veach, um, who's the preeminent, uh, preeminent guy when it comes to bourbon history uh, anywhere. Um, but he, he was able to trace it back, and it, it was its old mock, and it was made at the Stitzel Distillery. And I've had some this bar in Chicago called Delilah's. They've got one of the most insane whiskey collections I've ever seen. I think they're probably have somewhere between five and six hundred whiskeys across all categories. Um, they also have a lot of vintage bottlings, um, and he ended up with a case of it, and he gave me one as a gift. Uh, but he'll sell you anything he's got in his collection uh, if you're willing to pay for it. Um, and it, it's totally illegal to sell these old bottles that you know from a, a private collection. Uh, at least it is in Illinois. Uh, it now no longer is in Kentucky. That's a new law that just passed last week, so that's kind of cool. Um, but his way around it is, I bought it legally. I just don't have the invoice anymore because I bought it. You know. 25 years ago, the bar's been open for a long time, so he kind of gets around it. He, he's a bit of a, he's like a teddy bear, but he's kind of a bully too. Um, he doesn't put up with anything, but he's the, like the, the sweetest guy ever. This bar, if you ever make it to Chicago, you gotta check it out if you like whiskey, which I'm guessing y'all do. Um, it's called Delilah's, Delilah's, like Samson and Delilah. Um, it's a, punk rock whiskey bar. He's, you know, he's got $2 a drink whiskeys and he's got $2,000 a drink whiskeys. Uh, I walked in there for the first time in a coat and tie and I thought I was a dead man. Um, everybody in there is covered in, covered head to toe in tattoos. You know, everybody had the slick back or the pompadour hairdo, piercings. Um, combat boots. I, I mean, I thought I was a dead man, and I see in the corner this group of businessmen sitting there in their $2,500 suits, and I thought, okay, they're dead too. <laughs> uh, but everybody in there is super cool. Like, it's the most welcoming place. It's a really awesome place. It's tiny, it's hot, and sweaty, and, um, but it's an awesome place. Wednesdays are my favorite night. It's country and western night. They spend vintage country and western uh, records. And they have $2 shots of uh, Old Crow and $2 PBRs. PBR is a shitty old beer that has made a big comeback in the US. <coughs> or or uh, $3 for both. Um, it's just an awesome, awesome place. But yeah, he's got this crazy vintage whiskey collection and he'll sell you, sell you anything you, you want to try. Every bottle's got like in a wax pen, uh, got the price per, uh, for one ounce pour, um, or let's see, one or one and a half ounce pour. I can't. Anyway, um, I I go off on tangents. I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, my dad's got some some good old bottles. Uh, a chef friend of ours named Sean Brock had one of the the best collections of our my family's uh, whiskeys that I've ever seen. Uh, but He's started to sell it off. He had probably two million dollars worth of worth of um, stuff from between '33 and uh, and '92.
are mostly between 33 and 72. Like four and five bottles deep of the same bottling on a shelving unit like the size of this brick area. Pretty amazing. They started selling it off, and I can't, unfortunately, I can't afford these bottles anymore. <laughs> they used to sell, you know, like a eight year old bottle of old fits from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Used to be able to find for 250 to 500 on eBay. Uh, now they're 2,500 to five grand. It's a little rich for my blood. Uh, a lot of eBay banned alcohol sales in the U.S. several years ago. Um, we actually we spent when I say we, I mean us, Buffalo Trace, Sazerac, spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in legal fees trying to get eBay to install filters to eliminate our bottles from ending up on on the site and. They just wouldn't budge. They just didn't give a shit. And uh, you're all familiar with 2020, the television news magazine. Um, it's a just that. Uh, it's once or twice a week, hour-long show. Good investigative journalism. Uh, one of the most popular news shows in the states. Uh, they ran a piece uh, where they had a 15-year-old kid get on eBay and order like 15 cases of vodka and it was delivered to his door over time. Uh, and the day after that episode r ran on television, eBay banned alcohol sales <laughs> across the board. Uh, so all it took was a, a, a national news story and whammo shut down that probably cost them about 50 grand to produce. <laughs> cost them <coughs> thousands if not millions to do nothing. So we're working on Craigslist now. Um, is it, what are, what, are, what are the laws over here with yeah, regard to, is it, eBay over here as well. they did, y'all can still buy, you can buy booze on Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah. Amazon, yeah. yeah we can't. Actually, if you're a licensed, if you're a retail operation that has a website, you can use, Ant and you're shipping from a state where it's legal to sell online into a state where it's legal to buy online, you can use Amazon to facilitate sales, but otherwise you can't buy. What about like, if you had a bottle of whiskey and I wanted to buy it, would, could you legally sell it to me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's against the law in the states too. But so Craigslist, Craigslist essentially fac facilitates the breaking of, a, of state and federal laws and they don't seem to care that, <laughs> that they're complicit in that. So Craigslist is a big problem with the ratcheting up of the, the secondary market sales in the state. So trying to get them to remove all of our products, uh, which will de-incentivize it for the flippers and allow people who actually want to drink it at a decent price to get their hands on it. So we're working on stuff to, to eliminate some of the nuttiness that goes on with our products. Oh. You, haven't got, you haven't got many more to drink, have you? Because you've been <laughs> <laughs> You're getting more laid back. Yeah, I've uh, been drinking more and more and <laughs> loving it less and less. No, I'm just kidding. I love this stuff. Um, any more questions? Or Yes, sir. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, this might be a stupid question because I'm not, I don't know much about um, production. But so the first one, 10 years. So say I decide to make some bourbon today and put it in a whatever you put it in and do I have to wait for 10 years to find out if it's shit? Or do you like taste it every year to see like in a cup why they... We why don't taste along the way. Um, this far into it, we've got a few things figured out. Uh, at least we like to think so. So far so good. Um, I mean, my family's been doing it for 123 years. Um, you know, Harlan Wheatley, the master distiller at Buffalo Trace, uh, has been doing it for, he's been the one actually making the whiskey for at least 16 or 17 years. He learned from somebody who had done it for 40, who had learned from somebody who had done it for 50, who learned from somebody who probably did it for just as long. Um, so the big, the big distilleries have more or less got it figured out. Now, don't get me wrong, we empty barrels, we open barrels and sometimes something has gone wrong and you know, that's 
too bad, but it's, it's a rarity, not the norm. Uh, now, if you're a startup, you're going to need to taste frequently to see if you're headed down the right path. Because if you wait 10 years and it's shit, you got to start all over again. Mine would be. <laughs> well, a lot, of, a lot of these new ones are. Um, there are some great new micro, I don't like the term craft because it implies quality, at least in my mind, it, impl it implies quality and sometimes these craft distilleries and breweries aren't very high quality, um, but some of these micro breweries and distilleries um, are doing really neat, interesting, fun, different, amazing stuff, uh, but a lot of them aren't, a lot of them are just pumping out garbage and there's going to be a lot of, in my opinion, there's going to be a lot of very gently used distillery and brewery equipment available for sale in the next five to ten years. And they'll stop. There you go. <laughs> wait till, yeah, wait till somebody goes belly up and, yeah, you got it. Um, yeah, so the people ask if, if we're worried about the, you know, the craft distilling uh, overrunning us or, you know, taking up market share. There's so much room in the market for new stuff. Um, just because you you've bought this stuff or are buying this stuff and then you decide you also like something else doesn't mean you're necessarily going to stop buying this stuff. And if you do, at least with our products, even if you stop buying it, all these people who haven't been able to buy it, who want to, are going to, yeah, are going to have an opportunity. And if, if things, if the bubble bursts in the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada and wherever <coughs> else, we've still got China, India, Brazil. We get calls constantly from people in those countries looking for product. Is it, uh, is it mostly an export market that you deliver to? Or no, we, uh, we specifically export maybe 1% of our overall volume. The U.K. is uh, hands down our largest export market. Um, we sell, uh, we also sell in Canada um, more than I would like. Uh, the Sazerac's international sales manager, um, I don't know if he, if he is Canadian or if he just has a lot of ties in Canada, but he's bleeding us dry for product uh, constantly. Um, I don't. I don't have a problem with Canada. They're, I don't have a problem with Canadians. I've, I've never been up there. I've never seen what the whiskey market's like up there. Um, I've never had anybody from anybody who buys from us in Canada, any of the importers that we've used over the years. I've never spoken to a single one of them. They've never really expressed much interest in coming down and visiting us or learning about us. So I've, if we pulled out of Canada altogether, no love loss for me. I'd, wouldn't bother me a bit. It would mean more product in the U.S. or potentially over here. We have a couple of customers that have been with us for a long time that were buying, even just in small amounts, buying from us during the lean years. Uh, so we kind of throw them a bone, send them a few token cases in Sweden, Germany. Uh, there's maybe one in, maybe might send a couple of cases to Denmark, but I don't think anymore. Um, and then in Australia. But that's that's it. And is there an option or consideration for you to produce more? We are. It just uh, yeah, it takes ten to twenty three years. So we've <laughs> uh, we've got more ten and twelve year old than we've ever had. This coming fall, we'll have more fifteen year than we've had in ages. So we're we're starting to make a little bit of a dent, but it's you know it's a it's a dent in a big foot thick iron wall. Um, it's not a chink. It's not a not a gash, it's a, it's a little dent. Um, the demand just keeps growing exponentially and the supply is, you know, we're slowly turning the faucet on drip by drip. Uh, but we're, we are making more, but it just takes time and lots of it. So, uh, How widely released is the old group 25 mil? It's going to be the like states? Just the states, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know if anybody else saw it. We press release. We picked a really bad week to send out the press release because all the emails generated from our website come to me. I haven't been in front of my computer since last Friday. Uh, I've got 
several hundred emails to respond to. Um, we've we just press released that this spring we'll be releasing a 25 year old limited edition decanter. Uh, the decanter was designed and um, uh, handmade and designed uh, by a company up in Scotland called uh, the Glencairn Crystal Studio. <coughs> We've worked on them, worked with them on uh, another project. I'm sure you all have seen their glasses, the little Glencairn whiskey glass. Um, so they designed the bottle, and then from those eleven, from the eleven barrels that we dumped, uh, we sent the barrels, the empty barrels, to a company in North Carolina called Heritage Handcrafted. They're one of the biggest. Um, biggest users of reclaimed or repurposed uh, or just used bourbon barrels. They make furniture, um, boxes. Uh, so the lid of our box will be or is made from the staves from, from those 11 barrels. And then the whiskey is uh, 25 years old. A few years ago when we were tasting barrels for the 23, um, it was a situation where we had relative to other years, a bunch of 23-year-old barrels. And the following two years, we weren't gonna have more than maybe 50 or 60 for the year. So we bottled up all of those barrels and spread spread that out over the next three years, sales-wise. Um, but in the course of tasting those barrels, we identified a few that, uh, that were particularly heavy, that still had a, a fair amount of whiskey in them, and that were also um, still really uh, nice and light and sweet and not too oaky. And we decided to take a chance and let them, and let them ride it out another two years to hit 25, uh, just to see if we could, if, you know, if, it, if something went south, you know, we tried, it was, you know, a failed experiment, chalk it up to, you know, live and learn. And the sun's trying to peek out over there. Um, and it, it worked out that um, those 11 barrels were still really good, so uh, we dumped them and it, it's about 700 bottles worth. Uh, so that'll go out this spring. I mean, would you consider going older than 25? Or I'm sorry? Would you consider going older than 25? No, I don't think so. We found, a again, one of those situations where a barrel, the paperwork on a barrel just disappears. We found a barrel that was 28 years old um, not this past summer, but the summer before. And uh, we took some samples of it and we we filtered it a bunch of different ways, tried it at a bunch of different proofs, massaged it any way we could think of. Um, it was just too woody. Uh, we, my dad and I in, independently took uh, samples uh, to friends and relatives and uh, industry people whose Opinions and palates we respect, um, and tasted tasted the wine on it. Didn't tell them anything about it. Just said, yay or nay. And to a man, every one of them said it's it's too woody. I would never drink it. So um, we didn't know we had the barrel. Then we found it, and then it sucked. So you know, no skin off our teeth, I guess, really, in the end. But yeah, these these eleven barrels turned out really well. So. Nobody will probably ever open a single one of these, <coughs> one of these things. So, um, surely you can sell them. You can like put them in like really horrible packaging and be like, "This is the worst puppy ever," and people still pay like three grand for it. Oh, that twenty-eight-year-old girl. Yeah, we probably. Yeah, I, I, you know, we probably could have like done like done some sort of like gimmicky joke package saying like. Like You're a moron if you buy this. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, so Buffalo Trace has their whole experimental collection, and they've they've rejected plenty of experiments. Um, I have a bottle at the office that you know it's a pint bottle, and it's got the got the you know that experimental label on it that says exactly what it is and it's got in big red letters reject stamped across it. Across it, not across it. Uh, I'm from Kentucky but I'm not that big of a hillbilly. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean they could have gone for the cash grab with all these rejects and um, to, to their credit they have uh, they have not done that. So. Yeah, I, I don't know what became of that 
28 year old barrel, probably in some ancient age or something. You know, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> gone now, I don't know what happened to it. Somebody drank it. Somebody it was so heavy and woody. Um, I know you said you don't taste it as you kind of go along, you just sort of, you just know, you like the bang. So, at what point do you decide which barrels are going to be aged to which age and if it's going to work out? So, anything, say, say we make 100 barrels today, we don't know which one of these it's going to be necessarily. It's all made the same way. Where in the warehouse it ends up helps dictate that. Uh, the other thing that helps dictate that is what it becomes is um, when it's time, so say this year the sales forecast called for 2,000 cases of 12 year old. We'll look at what's in the warehouses that is uh, either about to be 12 or is, is in fact 12 years old and we'll kind of if we can find enough barrels in one spot to hit, based on the expected barrel yield, to hit 2,000 cases, we'll pull them all from that same spot. Uh, if we can only find like 1,500 cases worth, we'll pull all of that and then pull the next biggest group that fits in the mold, so to speak, and pull from there. Um, so at time of production, it could, it, it's, those barrel, their their fate is unknown. Um, when it is time to dump barrels, like last year or last week, rather, um, we had three hundred and six ten-year-old barrels uh, to make up what we're going to bottle for this this year's release in the fall. Excuse, excuse me, autumn. Um, so my dad and I went and tasted them all. One or the other of us, preferably both, will go and taste every single barrel. Um, last week it worked out that he could go on Monday, I couldn't, so he went on his own. I could go on Tuesday, he couldn't, so I went on my own, and then Wednesday we went together. Um, preferably both of us will taste them, but uh, if necessity demands it, we will, one or the other of us will taste. Uh, but Buffalo Trace all, also has a group of people that have been trained uh, to sit on the tasting panel and at least 12 people uh, in addition to the two of us have to taste all of the barrels. Um, one person doesn't have to taste all 306 but 12 people have to taste each of the, the, the barrels and if one or the other of my father and myself rejects a barrel it's rejected, no questions asked. If somebody else on the panel rejects a barrel, we'll come back and, and reevaluate it. And if we say, yeah, they're right, it'll get rejected. If we say, no, we think it's okay, it stays in the, stays in the, the pot. What's the rationale for you decide whether or not to reject the barrel? I'm sorry? What's the rationale for you when you decide whether to? Whether or not it, it closely enough matches the standard. So what we'll do is we'll taste a standard, so something from the previous bottling, and we're tasting against that. Um, when you're tasting for a single barrel pro product, you have to make sure that every single barrel tastes enough like the flavor profile that you're trying to match to move forward with it. When you're dumping um, 300 barrels all in the same tank, uh, you can have a barrel that's maybe say a little bit flat or dry uh, because you know because you know that yeah there's another one that's particularly vibrant and sweet uh, that's going to balance that out but you hope that most of the barrels match the, the brand standard uh, there are various degrees to which a, a barrel can be rejected it can be rejected because it's it's what we, we refer to as a little green, just not quite, not quite there. Um, it, it's still a little, you can still taste too much of the raw grain. Um, and if, you know, if you're tasting 10, 12, 15 year old barrels, okay, well, we'll try it again later for something older. Um, 
sometimes a barrel is okay, it's just never going to be worthy of wearing the Van Winkle name. Uh, and if it's just a bit off, it'll probably end up in uh, one of the Weller products. Uh, if it's off a little bit more than you would feel comfortable dumping in into a Weller dump, uh, it's probably going to end up in Benchmark or Ancient Age, something where you're dumping four or five hundred barrels at a time, and a barrel that's just a little bit off, it's it's going to get um, over overshadowed, masked by four or five hundred of its peers. Um, sometimes it's so far off that you know it's never going to be worth a damn, period, in which case, or it could be tainted somehow. Um, every now and then you get a barrel that has like a chemical -y component to it, uh, or if it's if it's got a little sliver of metal in it somehow and it's turned that blackish green color, um, then it goes down the drain and you get a small tax credit for it, but you're out the hundred or two hundred bucks that you spent on the barrel because you can't reuse them, and you're out that warehouse space and you're out the time that you've invested in carrying it for however many years. Those are unfortunate circumstances, they're rare, but it, ha it does happen. More often than not, we, we just kind of put it back into the, into the program and it, it, it gets used eventually some, somewhere, some way. Um, but I think out of 306 barrels, we rejected maybe 10. So what <coughs> ideally will happen then is we'll go find 10 more barrels to substitute for those rejects. Um, it may be at the expense of a few cases of Weller, but the margins on our products are a lot better. Uh, the prestige is a lot higher, and uh, every single bottle counts when it comes to allocating these <coughs> out. Uh, yeah? How do you uh, pick the barrels to use? Little two liters or it's a fifty three gallon barrel, so that's what two hundred and I got did the math. Yes, was it three point nine liters per gallon? Yeah. Yeah, so that's two hundred and six liters. But the industry standard is, is fifty three gallons. Um, they actually used to be forty eight. Uh, and then I think fifty one grew to fifty one and now fifty three uh, gallons, but do you have specialist barrels just for your um Almost, so most of the big distilleries buy from a cooperage called uh, Independent Stave. Um, they make barrel star specifications in terms of char level, where the trees are grown, you know, which is like this southwest facing slope or something like that. Um, certain growing areas have been identified as, as more desirable than others over time, but uh, yeah, so they, they make barrels to each each distillery's specs, all 53 gallons for the most part. They do make smaller smaller barrels, but um, what char levels do you use? <coughs> number four, so it's it burns for about 40 to 50 <coughs> seconds depending on the weather. Uh, I thought it was just a straight 50 second burn, but um, apparently we went, my dad and I went and toured the factory a while back and. Um, Apparently the humidity on that day determines how long the burn lasts. That was interesting. And so most most cooperages will build the barrel without the heads, and they'll have them upright, and they'll move on a conveyor and rest over the top of big gas spigots that will shoot a flame up through the top, you know, through the barrel for um, 40 to 50 seconds. What Independent Stave does, uh, they have them on their side, and they come in individually, um, and this—I don't know—I don't know what the hell it is. It looked like something out of a out of a movie. It, uh, was the Lord of the Rings movie when that fire smoke monster has that flame whip? <laughs> it looked like that. It's like it whips this flame around the inside of the barrel in like a corkscrew uh, fashion, and then a big forced air fan, it's like a jet engine, shoots, a, shoots hot air through the barrel that's been lit on fire, and that's what uh, 
causes the the burning action. Not you know, so you're not waste you're not wasting forty or fifty seconds worth of natural gas uh, for each barrel. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I I would love to know what that is. I'd like to have one for myself for parties. <laughs> <laughs> Do you sell any of your barrels on afterwards? Or um, so my sisters, I have three younger sisters, and they started a company about two and a half years ago. They named Pappy and Company. It's a dry goods business. Um, I sell hats, t-shirts, glassware, embroidered belts, ties, barrel stave products, scars, bourbon balls, all sorts of stuff. It's all real high quality stuff, nice stuff. But um, they're allocated a certain number of barrels for their, they do a nice like centerpiece style stave bowl. Um, they've got a really cool little like end table, it's called a cigar table, it's a metal frame and it's got, they've taken the staves and steamed them and straightened them back out and they're laid in like this, it's a, you know, what was that square. Pappyco.com is the website. Um, so yeah, this little cigar table that's sanded and finished nicely. Um, and then they also make a, they have a bourbon barrel aged maple syrup that is killer. Uh, unfortunately, it you know, probably take three times what the syrup itself costs to have it sent over here. But uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, and then they also, some friends of ours have been making hot sauce down in Georgia, Midland, Georgia. Uh, they use ghost peppers. Um, so they've started sending a few barrels down to, to this guy to age ghost pepper hot sauce. That's awesome too. So they get, you know, maybe 100 or 150 barrels a year. The rest go in. We don't technically own the wood after the whiskey's dumped. Uh, Sazerac does. Um, so most go to a barrel broker called Speyside Cooperage of Kentucky. Their parent company is in Speyside. Um, go figure. Uh, so we used to sell barrels, a few here, a few there, willy-nilly, to brewers and whoever wanted them. But we, we had a lot of problems with uh, intellectual property right infringement. People making beers and while they wouldn't necessarily put the Van Winkle name on the label, they would advertise it as being aged in our barrels, and my dad and I don't particularly care for, for barrel-aged beers. So not having any control over the, the quality of what they're selling and people using our name without permission, et cetera, um, we just put an end to the selling of, of any of our barrels to anybody other than this brokerage. Um, and I, They're supposed to be either sanding the heads or spray painting them so you can't tell what was in there. Has anyone ever approached you about doing something like that? Weekly. In those barrels specifically? Every single week. Yeah. <laughs> and the answer is no. Yeah. The last barrels we sold to anybody um, of any import was uh, uh, Sierra Nevada Brewery out of California. And they've done some, some of the only barrel aged beers that I care for. Um, but they don't use, they don't reference our products in any literature. There's no mention of it on the label. Um, they just do it under the radar. Yeah. Now we have done a couple of co-branded tasting events with them where we've said to folks, hey, guess what? This beer is actually aged and the barrel that this stuff came out of. Um, but yeah, we've had too many issues. It's too much of a liability at this point. You, know, you could if you buy ten of our barrels and age the world's shittiest beer and call it Pappy beer. That doesn't look too good on us. What was that brewery called? Yeah. I'm sorry. What was the brewery called? Sierra, Sierra Nevada. Nevada. They've got a beer called Narwhal. <coughs> um, it's really good. The regular Narwhal's really good. The barrel aged Narwhal's pretty good. <laughs> It took a really great beer and made it pretty good. <laughs> like when people ask for my signature on a, um, what's what's Christian's place called? No, Last Chance Saloon. Last Chance Saloon. Yeah, down in Nottingham. Uh, Christian, the owner, 
had on a Pappy t-shirt that came from my sister's. Um, he asked me to sign it. I'm like, well, now, now you're either going to wash it and the signature's going to go away, or you've got a completely useless t-shirt, or totally devalued. Um, I don't know why anybody would want my signature on anything. But, um, <laughs> Did you sign it? <laughs> What's that? Did you sign it? Yes, yeah, like across the shoulder. <laughs> it's going to have to have a $12 t-shirt dry cleaned from here on out. <laughs> How much do you buy what's cost? Um, it varies. Uh, it changes all the damn time based on um, industry demand, uh, speed at which they can be produced, uh, how quickly they can get the wood out of the forests. But uh, I want to say we're probably paying in the neighborhood of 150 bucks a barrel, 150 to 170 right now. But that's because we're buying thousands and thousands of barrels a just, year. Does um, the Cooper's supply a lot of slurries? They supply most of the big boys with the exception of Brown Foreman because Brown Foreman owns their own Cooper's called Kentucky Cooper's. Um, uh, yeah, so when you're, when you're cranking out as much whiskey as they are uh, for Jack Daniels, it, um, the, it makes sense to own your own cover shop. Uh, yeah, but most of the most of the big distilleries buy from uh, Independent Stave. There's another company that that makes nice barrels called Kelvin Cooperage, but they they supply a lot of the uh, smaller format barrels and large format barrels to uh, some of the smaller smaller distilleries. What else you got? Fire away. Did yes, you sir. Say you had a daughter that was born today. Yes. Would you encourage her to go into the pub business, or would you like to stay the fuck out of there? <laughs> if she or my son want to get involved, and I'm, I have a job for them. I hope I don't screw this up. I don't think my dad will ever retire, but um, <laughs> I hope I don't screw this up along the way. But yeah, if there's um, if there's an opportunity for either of them to get involved, I'd be more than happy to. Would happy you be to self-boss? Do you think, or would you be like, whichever? Dad, I want to stay on. It's hard to say. They're only seven and four, so. <laughs> um, it's not time to start work. Yeah. yeah. How big is the company itself? Is there a lot of employees? Or? Well, with this stuff, it's just my dad and me. Yeah. Uh, but Buffalo Trace, Sazerac have yeah. thousands across the across the globe. Yep. So uh, I'm just curious. Obviously, you guys have had to forecast a long time ahead. Do you? you are you looking to try and expand on mass, or is it something you're quite happy with the kind of the pace? And we're uh, we're making more and more each year, but we're doing so at a fairly conservative <coughs> pace. This whole bourbon boom, that bubble could burst at any any moment. I don't see it happening anytime soon, but it could. It it came on like a freight train. It could disappear <laughs> pretty quickly too. Um, we don't ever want to get back to the point where we're sitting on top of a lake of whiskey we can't sell. My family has been down that road on more than one occasion, and it's not a not a good side to be on. Uh, so that, you know we're we're doing well enough, or at least my dad's doing well enough um, that uh, we're we're cool with the current pace of things. Um, I would like to grow at least a 10 year old to a point where uh, you could conceivably walk in to a liquor store, at least in Kentucky, on any given day and have a, a fair, at least a fair chance of finding a bottle. But we're so far away from that. that um, you know, the pipeline is a is a is at a trickle right now. Uh, we'd like to be somewhere between where we are now and what I envision uh, by 2020. Um, well, I don't I don't ever want to catch up, and neither does my dad. Uh, as soon as you catch up, you, you move you move ahead, and that's uh, that's a scary proposition. But there's so much, even if the demand in the states dries up, we've, we've got so much interest in other places that's 
from our perspective, completely untapped. We haven't touched Asia since the early 90s, mid 90s. Um, yeah, again, Brazil, India, uh, big, big countries with big interest in bourbon, big populations interested in bourbon. India's interested. Interesting, you got a billion, 1.2 or so billion people. Uh, half the population doesn't drink a drop. The other half uh, drinks as much whiskey as anybody in the world. The number one selling whiskey brand is, in the world is an English or uh, Indian company. Well, um, nobody has any more questions. That's all I got for y'all. I appreciate everybody coming. I, yeah, 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 far away. How many, how many bottles since uh, last year? Um, we're in the we're bouncing around the eight to nine thousand nine liter cases. So that'd be a twelve bottle case. We actually sell a three pack for ease of allocation. But for the last few years, we've been bouncing around the eight to nine thousand case range, um, and it varies. You know, it varies because of barrel availability. So we'll have more twelve year some years and more ten year other years. Less we have less fifteen year this year than last. More twenty. Uh, about the same amount of 23, so each each expression kind of goes through little peaks and valleys. As the Buffalo Trace distillation kicks in, uh, hopefully there won't be any more valleys. There'll be small, like, small stair steps up. Do you find the variance between <coughs> the barrels changes? Does it get less variant over time? Uh, the new stuff that, that Harlan's been producing is remarkably consistent from barrel to barrel. The older stuff that's spent time at two or three different facilities, uh, that's a lot trickier to taste through because the barrels can be remarkably different. But, you know, in the, I tasted a, I tasted probably on the, Let's see, on Friday, I tasted uh, probably 60 barrels, and of the 60, only two were like significantly different than the rest. The others were so similar that it was like, you may as well have just been tasting the same thing over and over again, which is which makes it a lot easier, generally speaking, but you can get complacent when it's that easy and miss them. That's why we have the panel to back us up. Do you find the older it gets, the more consistent it becomes? No, the less consistent. It's gone, it's gone. Yeah, it's, uh, it gets less consistent with age. More time in the barrel means more potential for variation variables to play their part. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. <laughs> Any other questions, anyone? Thanks to the guys here for hosting us today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Cheers. If anyone does have any other questions that they didn't ask in front of the group, we'll be hanging around for a while. But just a round of applause for. Uh,